I'm glad to gather and to worship with you uh, in all of your sacred spaces and in this sacred space this morning. Uh, as we begin our worship, I'm going to invite you to uh, some silent prayer, some centering prayer, so we can set aside all of the, the things that jitter around in our heads and our souls this morning and uh, lift ourselves up to God for worship. Um, if you'd like to use our centering prayer this morning, we're going to pray, hold sacred space for my prayers, God who hears. So as you pray in, as you breathe in, excuse me, say, uh, hold sacred space for my prayers. And as you breathe out, pray, God who hears. Friends, let us pray. Let us pray. God, we come to you in prayer. We come lifting our prayers with our voices. We come lifting our prayers with our hearts. We come lifting our prayers with our actions, with our dreams, with our very lives. We bring to you all the prayers that fill up our days, the joys and the sorrows, the hopes and the heartaches the praising and the pleading and the prayers that come from such a deep place within us that we don't even have words. And we bring those prayers hoping, trusting, believing that you hear them, that you treasure them, and that you do indeed hold sacred space for them. And so God, we come. And so God, we worship. And so God, we pray. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from 1 Samuel chapter 1. It's just a tiny little bit different um, from what I posted on Facebook earlier this week, uh, a little extended. We're going to read verses 9 through 20, and then we're going to skip ahead to chapter 2 and read the first part of that as well. So friends, listen for the word of God. One time after eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah got up and presented herself before the Lord. Now Eli the priest was sitting in the chair by the doorpost of the Lord's temple. Hannah was very upset and couldn't stop crying as she prayed to the Lord. Then she made this promise. Lord of heavenly forces, just look at your servant's pain and remember me. Don't forget your servant, give her a boy. Then I'll give him to the Lord for his entire life. No razor will ever touch his head. As she kept praying before the Lord, Eli watched her mouth. Now Hannah was praying in her heart. Her lips were moving, but her voice was silent. So Eli thought she was drunk. How long will you act like a drunk? Sober up, Eli told her. No, sir, Hannah replied. I've just, I'm just a very sad woman. I haven't had any wine or beer, but have been pouring out my heart to the Lord. Don't think your servant is some good for nothing woman. This whole time I've been praying out of my greatest worry and trouble. Eli responded, then go in peace, and may the God of Israel give you what you've asked from him. Please think well of me, your servant, Hannah said. Then the woman went on her way, ate some food, and wasn't sad any longer. They got up early the next morning and worshiped the Lord. Then they went back to Ramah. Elkanah lay with his wife, Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. So in the course of time, Hannah conceived and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, which means I asked the Lord for him. Then Hannah prayed, my heart rejoices in the Lord. My strength rises up in the Lord. My mouth mocks my enemies because I rejoiced in your deliverance. No one is holy like the Lord. No, no one except you. There is no rock like our God. Don't go on and on talking so proudly, spouting arrogance from your mouth because the Lord is the God who knows and he weighs every act. The bows of mighty warriors are shattered, but those who were stumbling now dress themselves in power. 
Those who were filled full now sell themselves for bread, but the ones who were starving are now fat from food. The woman who was barren has birthed seven children, but the mother with many sons has lost them all. The Lord, he brings death, gives life, takes down to the grave and raises up. The Lord, he makes poor, gives wealth, brings low, but also lifts up high. God raises the poor from the dust and lifts up the needy from the garbage pile. God sits them with officials, gives them the seat of honor. The pillars of the earth belong to the Lord. He set the world on top of them. God guards the feet of his faithful ones, but the wicked die in darkness because no one succeeds by strength alone. The Lord, his enemies are terrified. God thunders against them from heaven. The Lord, he judges the far corners of the earth. May God give strength to his kind and raise high the strength of his anointed one. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Please pray with me. Holy One, this is indeed your word as we have read it, as we have heard it, as we have taken it into our hearts and our souls. Touch us with your understanding, with your wisdom, with the light of your word this morning. And God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are indeed our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, y'all, I have to be honest with you. It's starting to feel like this year of the narrative lectionary readings is all about difficult texts. We began with the story of Adam and Eve and the serpent in the Garden of Eden, which is never an easy story to tackle because it forces us to look at the active and complicit role we play in disobeying God. We continued a few weeks later with the story of the first Passover, which is a tough story because we catch a glimpse of God's vengeance in the final plague, the death of every firstborn in Egypt. Last week's story was about the Israelites and the golden calf and Moses talking God out of punishing the people harshly for their rebellion. Not exactly a warm and fuzzy bedtime story. But the thread that binds all of these challenging stories together is the steadfast nature of God's promise. God's promise remains even in the face of our human fickleness and failings. God's promise remains even in the face of injustice and oppression from those in power. God's promise remains even in the face of God's own frustration and indignation over human stubbornness and doubt. It is a promise of God's presence. It is a promise of God's love. It is a promise of God's hope, even in situations where hope seems most minimal. And then we come to today's story, the story of Hannah, her prayer, and her son, Samuel. And this is a bit of a painful story in and of itself. So first, let's fill in some of the gaps around today's portion of the story. There's a story about Elkanah. Elkanah has two wives, Hannah and Penina. Now, Penina has children, many children, and Hannah does not. Now, earlier in the first chapter of 1 Samuel, before what we read today, it says, every year Elkanah would leave his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of heavenly forces in Shiloh. Whenever he sacrificed, Elkanah would give parts of the sacrifice to his wife, Penina, and to all her sons and daughters, but he would give only one part to Hannah, though he loved her because the Lord had kept her from conceiving. Now, also revealed in this first part of the first chapter of uh, 1 Samuel is that Penina would tease Hannah mercilessly because she had no children. And today's story opens up on just such a time. Hannah is particularly distraught while they are in Shiloh, and so she goes to the temple to present herself to God. And in Hannah's words, we hear a prayer 
that is especially painfully poignant as we recognize that October is Pregnancy and Infant Loss Awareness Month. Scripture says, then Hannah made this promise. Lord of heavenly forces, just look at your servant's pain and remember me. Don't forget your servant, give her a boy. Then I'll give him to the Lord for his entire life. No razor will ever touch his head. I think it's hard for us to understand the true power behind Hannah's prayer and her vow. She is pleading with God with every fiber of her being for a child. And her longing is so deep and so desperate that she is promising to give that child back to God if only she can bring him into the world. And friends, this is not a prayer that is simply relegated to the pages of scripture and history. This is a prayer prayed by women around the world every day. If only God, then I'll give you this. I'll do that. I'll be this. I'll change that. Anything you want, God, if only. If only, God. If only. Now, Hannah's prayer exemplifies everything that is both culturally wrong and wholly right when it comes to our attitudes about prayer. You see, Hannah's prayer is raw and real. It is revealing in the most intimate of ways, bearing her heart and her soul openly to God. It's the kind of prayer that we aspire to, but also the kind of prayer that makes us uncomfortable to witness. It's not the Minnesota nice form of prayer. Please and thank you, God, if you have time. Reverend Joanna Herriter, who is a fellow young clergywoman, says Hannah's prayer is simply not proper. She is far too bold before God, far too emotional. We are much more comfortable with the way Jesus taught us to pray, head bowed, eyes closed. Okay, that's not actually in the Bible, but we know that's how it works, right? Your will be done. Give us your daily bread in a modest, humble controlled prayer. There is much good in the prayer that Jesus taught us. It is our model. That is why we pray it, or at least some version of it, every Sunday. But, Joanna says, I want to lift up the virtues of the improper prayer, of Hannah's gut-wrenching, emotionally charged tirade and bargaining session. And so Hannah is there in the temple, distraught to the point where she is sobbing uncontrollably. And then we have this strange and frankly uncomfortable interaction between Eli the priest and Hannah. Hannah is standing there praying and crying. And our text said Hannah was praying in her heart. Her lips were moving, but her voice was silent. We can just feel the passion and the fervor in Hannah's prayers, can't we? Because we've all prayed prayers like this at some time, haven't we? Prayers into which we pour every ounce of ourselves, our hopes, our dread, our desperation, our longing, and our whole hearts. They're prayers we've prayed for ourselves. Their prayers we've prayed for our loved ones, their prayers we've lifted up for our neighbors and for our country and for our world. These are those soul-bearing, soul-altering prayers of our deepest selves. The prayers that we pray in anxiety and distress, the prayers that give voice and hope to the most fervent hopes and fears of our souls. The prayers that cannot help but have a lasting effect on the course of our whole lives. And so Eli finds Hannah praying this kind of prayer, pouring her heart and her soul, her words and her tears into this whole body kind of prayer. And Eli's response is awkward, to say the least. Eli thought she was drunk. 
How long will you act like a drunk? Sober up, Eli told her. No, sir, Hannah replied. I'm just a very sad woman. I haven't had any wine or beer, but have been pouring out my heart to the Lord. Don't think your servant is some good for nothing woman. This whole time I've been praying out of my great worry and trouble. Did you just cringe? Because I did. In the midst of this greater lesson on prayer, Eli gives us this delicate and uncomfortable lesson on snap judgments, right? Eli assumes he knows exactly what's going on, so he reprimands this lone woman who's acting a little odd, expecting her to apologize and repent. But instead, Hannah pours out her heart to him begging him to believe that she is not drunk, but is instead distraught. Yikes. A reminder that we never know what struggles someone may be bearing in silence, right? So after Hannah explains this to Eli, he sends her off with a blessing. Hannah heads home with Elkanah and the rest of the family. And scripture says the Lord remembered her and she becomes pregnant with Samuel. And friends, there is so much that's challenging wrapped up in that turn of events. We see so many difficult questions in this text. Were Hannah's prayers so much better so much louder, so much more effective than the prayers of thousands of others who have prayed exactly the same thing with no result? Was there something special about Hannah that God chose to remember while refusing or neglecting to remember so many others who have felt that same pain and prayed that same prayer? Was there something about Eli's blessing that tipped the scales in Hannah's direction that turned a spotlight onto her plight and drew God's attention in an undeniable way? I don't think the answer to any of those questions is yes. And yet we cannot help but ask them, can we? Because whether we realize it or not, we all know someone who has struggled with fertility, with pregnancy loss, with the loss of a child, Statistics say one in four women will suffer, suffer some sort of miscarriage or pregnancy loss in their lives. One in four will pray that same prayer that Hannah prayed. Some will conceive or conceive again, and some will not. And that leaves us wrestling with just how complicated prayer can be. Prayer is complicated in the asking, in the how, in the why, in the words. Prayer is complicated in the waiting, in that in-between time. And prayer is complicated in the response, whatever the response. Prayer is the rawest, realest, most fragile and precarious act of faith that we can engage in because it, because it involves nothing but our greatest vulnerability. It involves naming our weaknesses and our deepest longings to God. God already knows them, but we have to put words to them. It involves holding them out to God and hoping that God will act, trusting that God will act but without any kind of assurance that God will act in the way that we want God to act. And prayer involves uncertainty. And human beings are not very good at uncertainty. I think our golden calf story from last week proved that pretty well. Paul speaks of prayers like this in Romans. He says, likewise, the spirit helps us in our weakness for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but the very spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. In her book, Everything Happens for a Reason and Other Lies I've Loved, Kate Bowler says, I plead with a God of maybe, who may or may not let me collect more years. It is a God I love and a God that breaks my heart. 
Sometimes we get to pray the prayer that Hannah prays at the end of our scripture reading this morning, a prayer of joy and thanksgiving that is literally overflowing from her soul, just like her tears overflowed as she prayed in the temple at the beginning of our text. And sometimes we are left aching and wondering. And I wish with all I am that I could tell you why this morning, that I could wrap it all up for you in a nice, neat, easy theological package and say, here's the solution. Pray exactly this way and God will always do what you ask. But we all know I can't do that. What I can tell you is that getting an undesired response to prayer is not a reflection on the way that you prayed. The form, frequency, the fervor, or the faith behind your prayers. You see, there's a lot of really bad, really twisted, really harmful theology swirling around in Christian circles today that will try to tell you that if you're suffering, it's because you haven't prayed hard enough or faithfully enough. This theology will try to tell you that cures and miracle fixes and the answer to all your problems lies right around the corner if only you get your prayers right. But that's wrong. Do you know what lesson we can take from this difficult text on prayer and pain this morning? God's presence. That promised presence. God does indeed hear our prayers. God holds sacred space for them all, the happy ones and the sad ones, the desperate ones and the delighted ones, even the most boring and basic ones and the ones we cannot even put words to. God is there with us in the midst of prayer, arms open, heart open, grace open and beckoning because in the end, friends, that is why we pray to remind ourselves that God is indeed there as promised. And to remind God that we are here and we are willing to engage in our faith, even when it is gut-wrenchingly, soul-achingly hard. Amen. So indeed, friends, we come to our time of prayer this morning to lift up all of those things that are parts of our lives and our days and our movements. There are a couple of prayers. Um, if you got our uh, worship write-up document before church this morning, there are a couple of prayers to add to that. Uh, and I will send them out in our prayer request email uh, tomorrow morning. But we want to continue to pray for uh, Sandy and for Linda and their health. We want to continue to pray for Anna and the treatment of her brain tumor. We want to keep praying for Xavier as his uh, audiology and ophthalmology appointments are just around the corner, a week or two away. Um, and for Cynthia and Xavier as they have to go through COVID tests and all of the preparation that goes up to that. Um, we want to continue to pray for Carol Teedy and her health issues and for Joanne's friend, Kathy. Uh, she receives treatment for cancer. We want to continue to pray for Cecilia, who is done with her cancer treatments and now is in this waiting period between um, tests and getting test results and all of that. Uh, we want to continue to pray for uh, Ellen's husband, Ed, uh, and his cancer treatments and for uh, Janice's brother, Fred, and his wife, Monica, who are both receiving treatments for cancer. Uh, we also wanna pray for uh, Janice's other brother, Laverne, and his wife, Barb. They uh, live in Colorado. Uh, their home is very near to where the uh, Cameron Peak fire is burning right now. Uh, Laverne and Barb are safe, which is a joy, um, but their home is uncertain right now, um, as are the homes and lives and businesses of thousands of people. Uh, so we want to lift those people up in prayer and also um, 
any all of the firefighters that are working so hard to try and control this place. Um, we want to pray for Jen and her healing this week. Uh, and we want to pray for uh, Ellen Warner's sister in law, Connie, uh, who is in the hospital with some health issues. We want to pray for Ellen Simon's grandson, Alex. Um, we prayed for Alex uh, a while ago, who was having some trouble with his heart. And uh, Ellen shared with us that he is having open heart surgery this week on Thursday. So we want to lift Alex up in prayer. Um, and we want to lift up Joyce uh, Rucker, who is in the hospital and uh, facing some possible surgery this week as well. Um, and then as always in this time of COVID and um, upside down world and school friends, we want to lift up our teachers and our administrators and our school staff um, and parents as we all navigate the weirdness of this school year. So friends, please join me in prayer. Sometimes, God, prayer is indeed complicated. Sometimes we whisper our prayers, anxious in the hope that we infuse them with the second we give voice to them. Sometimes we sing our prayers to the heavens with all the joy in our hearts. Sometimes our prayers sound more like wordless cries, cries of worry, cries of anguish, cries of frustration. And sometimes we come to you not even sure what to pray, how to pray. We come with prayers woven out of breath and breath alone because that is all we have. Reassure us in our prayers, God. Not that you will answer them in the ways we ask for, but that you hear us in all our forms of prayer. Reassure us that your promise and presence never leave us no matter the prayers of our hearts and our lives. Reassure us that you are with us and that you hear us even as the prayers uh, just begin to form on our lips and in our hearts. Reassure us that no matter what, prayer draws us ever closer to you. Holy One, we pray for healing, for comfort, and for wholeness for those in need today. For Sandy, for Linda, for Monica, for Anna, for Carol, for Fred, for Kathy, for Connie, for Alex, for Joyce, for Jen, and for Ed. Let's lift up special prayers for Cecilia and her family during this time, this time of waiting between the end of her treatments and the tests that we pray will show that those treatments worked and her cancer is in remission. And during this Breast Cancer Awareness Month, we lift up special prayers for all those who are currently battling breast cancer, for those who have battled breast cancer in the past and continue to deal with the after effects and for all those who grieve loved ones lost to breast cancer. And we also pray for those who are suffering because of this pandemic, especially here all across the Midwest as the cases around us start to climb startlingly high. We pray for those who are sick, for those who are in critical condition, for those who are watching and praying for and worrying about loved ones who are sick, for those who are waiting for test results or are ill but cannot be tested. For those who have recovered from the coronavirus itself but are now dealing with a host of other medical issues because of this virus. And for those who are grieving the loss of loved ones. We lift up those in need of your peace, your strength and your protection. We pray for Xavier and Cynthia as these ear and eye tests approach, as well as the COVID tests that they will both need for the appointments. We pray for Laverne and Barb and all those whose lives and homes and livelihoods are being threatened by the wildfire in Colorado. We pray for safety. We pray for favorable weather that will slow the spread of this fire. And we pray for all the firefighters and others who are putting their lives on the line to fight this fire. We also pray for teachers, 
school administrators, school staff, and parents as we all navigate the, the uncertainties and the hard decisions that face us day in and day out during this time of COVID. During this Pregnancy and Infant Loss Awareness Month, God, we lift up all those who have felt the acute and terrible loss of a child far too soon. And we continue to lift up special prayers for all those healthcare workers who are giving every ounce of themselves in fighting this pandemic as they care for people. They are working incredibly hard. Their dedication inspires us and reassures us in the deepest part of our humanity. Keep them safe and give them moments of rest and respite in the midst of this colossal battle that they're fighting day in and day out. Keep them encouraged and help us to find ways to show how much we appreciate their efforts and their bravery. God, we lift up all of these prayers and all of the prayers that we name only in the silent parts of our hearts. And we give them to you in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, our prayer this morning, or excuse me, <laughs> well, that was actually a little bit right. Our hymn for this morning is a prayer hymn. Uh, it comes from uh, the Teze community in France. And Teze music, if you're not familiar, is uh, music that is meant to be sung over and over and over again. It is a simple tune. It is a short tune. Um, and the idea is that as you sing it over and over, the music uh, kind of fills up your soul and embodies your prayer. Um, and so our prayer, our, our hymn, prayer, hymn, prayer this morning is, O oh Lord, hear my prayer. And that will pop up on Facebook in about 10 minutes here. So friends, as you go from this place today, go trusting that God hears your prayers, those of your voice and those of your heart, those of your days and those of the darkest parts of your nights. God hears them, God treasures them, God holds them holy and worthy of God's own love and grace. And friends, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.